Tonight we're in chapter 43 of the book of Ezekiel. I was going to take you into chapters 43 and 44. Obviously I'm not because I got hung up on the study in chapter 43 today. And so we'll be picking up, God willing, next time we get together at chapter 44. And I'm going to try and combine some of the chapters kind of like I did last time we were together here uh, because much of what we have in chapter 44 really can be summarized. And even chapter 43, I'm going to take some time in the first portion here in chapter 43 and take you through the study uh, almost as I normally do, and then I'll be summarizing the last half of this book, or rather this, uh, this chapter, and you'll see that in just a moment. But let's begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 43 at verse 1. I'll read to you verses 1 through, um, through 5, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel 43 beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of, of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Kivar, and I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now we've been looking here in Ezekiel in these last chapters at a temple. It's a future temple, a temple that will in the yet future be built. It's been called the Millennial Temple. It's also called the Memorial Temple. Now, as I was sharing with you last time, when you remember, and remember with me, when you study the Bible, when you look into the Old Testament, you see that, that, uh, that as I mentioned before, David had a son by the name of Solomon. King David had a son by the name of Solomon. And, and, and David handed the kingdom over to his son, son Solomon. We know that David wanted to build God a temple because God had been basically his... his uh, Ark of the Covenant and all had been resting in a portable tent called a tabernacle. And, and remember with me how that David wanted to build a place for the Lord. And, and, and so the prophet Nathan had spoken to him and had said to him, that thing which is in your heart is really a good thing, but God hasn't commanded you to build him a temple. And, and uh, because David was a man of war and his hands were bloody with, from battles and all, he said, you're not the man who's going to do that. God has somebody else planned who's going to be able to do that. And we've seen that as, as we've gone through our studies in the Old Testament that, that David had a son named Solomon, and Solomon is the one whom the Lord allowed to build the temple. That took place uh, between 900, uh, almost 1,000 years before Christ, this temple called Solomon's Temple. And then we see that the temple that had been built was destroyed by by uh, the Babylonians, and ultimately in 538 B.C., God had uh, given permission to Zerubbabel to return, and he returned and, and did construction on this temple that had been destroyed, and so you have what is called Zerubbabel's temple. And then later on, we see in history that, that during the time of Christ, there was a man by the name of Herod. Herod was known for being a great builder. And uh, Herod was somebody who worked on constructing that or refurbishing the temple during Jesus' time. And, and it took something like uh, 46 years of continuous construction as well as simple just work, uh, even into the time of Jesus. And so there's Herod's temple. And, and, and then as we study the Bible, we, we note that, that Jesus refers in Matthew 24 to a time when the... Uh, the Antichrist is going to enter into a temple. So we know that that's a future temple that is yet to be built, and that has been referred to as Antichrist Temple. And so when you read your Bible, you'll discover that there are various temples that are mentioned in Scripture. Now, one of the things that I find interesting is the fact that Antichrist Temple is going to be reconstructed. We do believe that part of the covenant that the Antichrist makes with the nation of Israel that is recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, that part of the covenant, this peace treaty that, that he's going to have with the nation of Israel, will more than likely have something to do with the rebuilding of this temple, this temple that will be reconstructed during a period of time that is called the tribulation, the seven-year period. Now, one of the things that I've thought often about is this temple that was reconstructed during that time. 
It's the Antichrist temple. I mean, the, the, the glory of God is not present in that temple. The glory of God has departed. The glory of God departed from the temple during the time of Ezekiel. And nowhere when you read the Bible does it ever say that the glory of God returned because it hadn't. It's never mentioned as returning during the time of Zerubbabel. It certainly wasn't present there during the time of Jesus in the sense of, of how God would be there to meet with the people in the way that he had done in Old Testament times. It isn't referred to, the glory of God is not referred to as being in the temple uh, during the time of the Antichrist, but here we have in the book of Ezekiel, God speaking concerning the fact that his glory will return. And so when the, when the glory of God returns, it's going to be during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, earlier in, in Ezekiel, in chapters 10 as well as 11, Ezekiel had described how that God's glory had departed from the temple. According to chapter 11, verse 23, it says there, the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. So the glory of God departed. Now, the reason that we have seen the glory of God departed from the, uh, the temple there was because the nation of Israel rejected God and rejected his word. And, and because they were in rebellion against the Lord and because they were idolaters, God's glory departed from his temple. And so now this nation that had backslidden into idolatry had lost the presence of God. And so God removes his presence from them as he removes his glory from the temple. Ezekiel is now speaking here in chapter 43 about the fact that God's glory will once again be present in that temple. Notice in verse 2 how he says here, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So he's speaking concerning the fact that God once again is going to dwell amongst the nation of Israel. This takes place during the time of Christ as Jesus is ruling and reigning in what is called the thousand-year rule of Christ or reign of Christ. God's glory returns because by this time God has finished his judging of the nation. God has once again regathered his people and God has once again restored them. And so it's during that time that God once again is making his presence known there in the temple. Now, what makes the temple the temple? That's something to think about for a moment. Simply because a building is built doesn't mean that God's presence is there. A, a sanctuary can be designed, it can be built, it can be even dedicated to God, it can be occupied, but the sanctuary is still only a building. It, it becomes a holy place when God is present. It becomes a holy place when the Lord is occupying that space. That's when it becomes a place that can be called a holy place. See, God had, had made it clear that his presence was going to depart from the, from the temple. So when Zerubbabel reconstructed the temple, God's glory is never mentioned as being there, as I mo uh, mentioned a moment ago, because God's glory doesn't return until Jesus comes to rule and reign. Now, as we're looking at this right now, the presence and glory of God is going to fill the place. It's going to fill the place like it did in the tabernacle. It's going to fill the place like it did when, when Solomon dedicated the temple. In, in Exodus, in chapter 40, verses 34 and 35, when the tabernacle was being de dedicated to God, it says, the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, or rather the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When the temple was dedicated, uh, it says in 1 Kings chapter 8, 10 and 11, it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. There have been times, there have been times in the history of this fellowship, and I long for those times to return, to be honest with you. I share, with, I, I share this with my staff sometimes, and I share it with music teams. There have been times in the history of this fellowship 
when you could sense God's presence in a very holy and very powerful way to the degree that it was almost overwhelming. There have been times when the Lord's presence has been so specially felt that it's changed my life. Years ago, when I was an assisting pastor in another fellowship, I was asked with two of the other men who were leaders in the church. I was the assistant pastor and, and two of the men who were leading in the fellowship as, as elders. I was asked along with them to take the names of the men who were there at the retreat. There were something like 40 men. And during the evening service on Saturday night to pray for each one of those men specifically, which we still to this day do. We take names of the guys who've registered and we pray over those names for those men. And I remember very well as these three men and I, two men and I were together in one of the other rooms taking each one of those men's names and lifting them to the Lord in prayer. In the other room, there was a time of worship that was going on and we were going to pray through that time of worship and then come in for the evening service for the teaching of the Word. And, and we were there praying for about 30, 35 minutes. I'll never forget this. When we finished praying, we came walking into the room and when we walked into the room, it was it was most interesting thing. It, the men were they were crying. These men, some were on their knees, others were just weeping openly, others were hugging and 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 sharing with brothers. And I looked at the senior pastor when I walked in. He was up in the front, and and all these tears and everything. I looked at him, and walked up to him, and he says, "I haven't said a word yet." He said, I, "I've just been standing here." He said, and look what these men are doing. Look what happened. It was one of those sovereign moments when the Holy Spirit just broke through. It was one of those times that you really don't see all the time and happen that much. When the glory of God, when the sense of His presence, when God's Spirit filled that place to the degree that the men were on their knees weeping and worshiping God. And the glory of the Lord was there. And I want that for us. It's not something that you contrive, by the way. It's not something that you say, okay, so we're going to have that next week, so come ready to cry <laughs> and wear some knee pads because you'll be on your knees for sure. I mean, it's not anything like that. It, it's it's when, when the hearts are, are ready to meet God, and it's when God is, is who is always ready, it's when God has an opportunity to finally meet with His people. And see, this is a foreign thought for many believers. This is a foreign thought for many Christians that... That, that God, when He moves in a certain place and when He acts in the way that God does, that, that such a thing as glory might, might cause people to do things that, that are different. I mean, notice in verse 3 how it says, it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I, when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Kevar. I fell on my face because the power and glory of God was so present there that there was nothing that he could do. Now, during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, as I mentioned earlier, there was a temple. But that temple was polluted. It's interesting to note when you look at the ministry of Jesus that, that Jesus came to Herod's temple. It's called Herod's temple. Jesus came to Herod's temple at the beginning of his ministry. When you read your Bibles and you read in the Gospel of John chapter 2, at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, Jesus came into that temple and he came with the purpose. It's recorded there in chapter 2 how that, that he came in in verses 13 through 17 during the time of the Passover. And it says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, poured out the changers' money, and overturned the tables. He said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. 
At the beginning of the ministry, Jesus Christ came in. He saw what was taking place, and he cleaned it out. He, he, he had all of that which was polluting the house of God. He said, you need to leave, and you need to leave now. And he actually drove them out. But he did it again at the end of his ministry. In Mark chapter 11, verse 17, it says that he taught them, saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house for prayer for all nations? You have made it, he said, into a den of thieves. So from the beginning, Jesus said, listen, this is a place that, that is to be a, a holy place. And so take them out. This is my father's house, and you've made it into a house of merchandise. And then later on, he says the same thing. Now, you can learn an awful lot of, uh, about a person by, by just seeing what makes that person mad. I can learn something about you just by seeing you get mad over something. I learn what makes you mad, and it, and it shows me your values. It shows me what it is in your life that actually can perturb you, and, 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 and our values are pretty much expressed by the things that anger us. And so when you look at Jesus, you can learn something about Jesus by just seeing what made him angry. And what made the Lord Jesus Christ angry was the house of God was to be a house of prayer. And what had happened is that it had become a den of thieves. And that's why he responded in the way that he did. Because God's temple has always been intended for a place of worship of God. In Isaiah 56, verse 7, God said, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. In Jeremiah 7, 11, Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? And so when Jesus saw what was taking place, his father was being blasphemed, the temple desecrated. Well, that moved him into action. And he responded with a righteous anger towards those who were doing such a thing. Psalm 69, verse 9 says, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. It's consumed me. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ walked in and saw that, there was an anger that took place within him that, was, which, that is called righteous indignation. So Jesus got upset because there was a desecration of the temple. But also, Jesus got upset because the people were being disillusioned. They were being disillusioned by those who should have known better. You see, the priests had established inspectors who said that the animals that were being brought in for sacrifice were unfit for sacrifice. And so what they would do is they would confiscate the animal, and then they would sell them an animal that was, uh, was, was being sold to them for 10 times its value. And when the money was exchanged, as they would come in from other countries with foreign currency, they'd go to the exchange, they were actually uh, losing money on it. They did so at a 25% rate of exchange. So Jesus saw the desecration of the Father's house. He saw the disillusionment of the people, and it drove him to anger, and that's why he drove these people out. Now, the true glory of God is Jesus himself. And Jesus Christ, who is the glory of God, had entered into that temple. And Jesus, the glory of God, came in to remove that which was impure. When I look at this, I think in terms of how God is so presented to us in Scripture, is so awesome. We just sang a song that's really in reference to the book of Isaiah chapter 6, where in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah says, when King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, and he was high, and he was lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he speaks concerning seeing flying creatures who, who were saying, holy, holy, holy uh, to the Lord God. And he said, and I saw the, the smoke and I, and I saw all of these things and it was just unbelievable. And, and he said, and when I saw these things and I was in the presence of such holiness, he said, at that time, uh, I realized and I even went on to say, woe unto me because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst a people with unclean lips. And, and the bottom line is he was saying, what, what I saw moved me in such a way that I realized that my life is not what it ought to be. My life is not pure before God, even though he was a prophet. If you look in Isaiah chapter 5, you see that many times he says, woe unto Israel. But when you get into chapter 6, he finally says, woe unto me. It's one thing Isaiah, in other words, had a, a, a message for the people of Israel, but finally, when he saw God for what God truly is, he realized, who am I to speak in his name? I've been saying things about him that have not in any way, shape, or form ever really given him full justice. I cannot describe the indescribable. 
And so woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. We do not know how to praise and worship and glorify God because he's much beyond our ability to do so. On one occasion, there was a man by the name of Moses, and Moses had spoken to the Lord God, and Moses had a very close relationship with God. He was the deliverer of Israel, and, and God had given to him his commandments and all, and so Moses had a very tight relationship with the Lord God Almighty. And so he takes it upon himself to say to the Lord God, show me your glory. In Exodus 33, show me your glory. And God says to him, no man can see my glory and live. No one can see my glory. He says, but I'll reveal to you something of it. And the Bible tells us in chapter 34 of Exodus how that, that God placed him in the cleft of a rock and hid him with his hand and allowed the residue of his glory to be seen by Moses. And as God went by and, and just showed him that which was left behind, Moses saw what an incredibly powerful and glorious God it was that he worships. And that's something that we need to understand today. Again, I'm, I, I pray for, for myself. I pray that God would help me to get a glimpse of heaven, to get a glimpse of him, to get a glimpse of his, of his awesome majesty and his power, his, his goodness. What is interesting is when, when God reveals his glory to Moses, he does so by giving to him a glimpse at his name. And he speaks concerning the fact that he is God who is compassionate and and, and says several things concerning himself because the glory of God is, is discovered through God's character. And so God gives his name and says, this is what my glory is. So later on, later on we know that God reveals to us his glory through Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus is ruling and reigning once again, the temple will be filled with the glory of God. Notice in verse 2 here in, in, in Ezekiel uh, chapter 43, notice how it says his voice was like the sound of many waters and the earth shone with his glory. It's the sound of waves crashing, many waters reveals the power and majesty of God. I mean, if you go out to the seashore and they're having these huge waves and, and the breakers hit and you hear the sound and the thundering, that's the picture. In Revelation, speaking of the Son of Man, Jesus, it says in Revelation 1.15, the Son of Man's voice was as the sound of many waters. So it reveals his majesty. But he also says the earth was shining. And this earth shining reveals the brilliance of light. And we know that light will always dispel darkness. And when you read your Bible, you see that darkness is very often a picture of that which is, is unfaithful or error or distress. It's, it's used sometimes as a picture of sin. And the Bible says that God is a God of light, and God brings illumination to darkened souls. In, in 1 John 1, 5, he said, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And so when he sees this, this glory of God, it, it's, it's something that brings a, a brightness. It's something that shines. The earth shone with his glory. Now, we believers, we who are Christians, we've been enlightened. You know, sometimes you hear of these Hindus who say that they're going to bring you enlightenment, and then they, they press their thumb into your forehead, and they say you're being enlightened, you know. And, and no, we're not enlightened by somebody's dirty thumb in my forehead. I, I was enlightened uh, when I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I am illuminated by the power of the Word of God, and I'm illuminated or enlightened uh, by, by the, the Spirit of God who dwells within us. In, in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 4, verses 3 through 6, it says, even if our gospel is, is hidden, it is hidden to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so we have been enlightened by the Lord Jesus Christ, and the earth that is shining is only a picture of the fact that God's light dispels darkness. That's what happened when you got saved. Your mind was clouded with sin. You thought 
that which was, was, was uh, sour was sweet. You thought that which was evil was good. You, you thought things that just were not true because your, your whole life, my whole life was, had been basically dictated by, by somebody else's belief system. And when I got saved and I started reading the Bible, I finally was able to see what truth is. And I can still remember as an early believer, there were people who were saying, oh, you've been brainwashed. And, and you know, you're brainwashed. And, and at first that was offensive. And then one day I realized, you know, that's true. My brains were dirty, and they needed to be washed, and they were washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So indeed, my, my brains have been washed by the blood of Christ because what I saw at one time I thought was true, and it was error. What I believed when, at one time was true was not truth at all. It was a lie. I believed that there were many roads, many ways, many pathways to God, not just one. Ultimately, I came to realize that, that every road ultimately leads to God, but that comes into judgment. Somebody coming to God, they're going to be, in other words, they're going to be seeing God one way or another. But what takes me to heaven is faith in Jesus Christ and the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of the world, and it's His glory that I want. Now, some people don't really want that. What they want is they want to go somewhere, maybe romantic like, like India, and, and they want to have some guru press them in the forehead. They want to have some enlightenment, walk away with some flowers around their, their necks and all, because that's what they do there. I've been to, I've been to, to India. I've been there twice. I, I've, I've spent some time there. I've seen what goes on there. I've seen the result of the religious faith of the Indian people. You, you may not know this or even realize this, but India is the most religious nation on the face of the earth. And the average Indian, if he's a religious person, which the average one is, is they believe in multitudes of gods, various gods. They're very religious people. But in India, the rats will eat enough grain in a year to fill boxcars filled with grain that would stretch from Los Angeles to New York City. The rats and the pestilence and the disease and everything that is going on there is a direct result of their, of their religious belief system. I have been in the Hindu temples. I've walked into them in India. And I have seen outside the doors of these temples little girls and little boys wearing rags with their hands stuck out begging you for food when you walk in. When the pilgrims, when the Indians themselves who are coming in to worship are bringing grain so that they can put it on stone so that rats can eat the grain. When you have starving children outside but you're taking your grain and giving it to a rat, there's something wrong with your religious system. When you don't have compassion or concern for that baby, there are men who actually will, will sell their children, especially the little girls, they'll sell them to a, a, what we would today call a pimp. And what he does with them is he will disfigure them. Sometimes they break their hands and they break their arms and they let them heal in a crippled position so their hands cannot be used anymore. And they send them out so that these children can stick those little crippled hands towards you and ask for money. And if you give them money, they don't take it for themselves. They take it back and they give it to the man, the handler, the pimp. That's what they do in India. And yet we have people who think it's so beautiful. You can be enlightened in India. I was in a plane. I was flying home from some ministry one time. And some man was seated next to me, some stranger, he and his wife. And, and the woman uh, and I started to talk. The man, actually, I was sharing the gospel with her husband. And, and he was real interested. Where, where are you coming from? Well, I'm coming from here. What were you doing? I'm a minister. I was just teaching about Jesus Christ. So really, what were you saying? I gave him a bit of a message. And as I was sharing with him, the wife turns and looks at me. And she goes, she goes, oh, I just love India. I love their religion. I said, you love India and its religion? She said, yeah. I said, you love a religion that causes children to be sold into slavery. You love a religion that, that rats eat all the grain while people are starving. You love a religion, and I been, went off on her really big time, and she really didn't want to hear it after a while. It's kind of like, sorry, you know, but hey, you think that's good. And I said, you go to the Taj Mahal. I've been there. You go there. You see the pictures, and it looks beautiful, doesn't it? It's grimy, and it's filthy. And that little, that waterway in front of the Taj Mahal, 
It's filthy. It's polluted. And what you get is just pictures of India once you step on this. When you step into India, when you got off the plane and you smell decay everywhere, when you drive your car mile after mile after a mile, and you see people who put tents up in the middle of the islands and traffic islands because there's no place for them, when you know that during the monsoon season there are more rats going on in Bombay who are in Bombay than, than people who live there, when you see millions and millions of people starving, when you drive by a a lake of sewage, which we did. A lake of sewage. I thought it was just a polluted or a dirty lake. It was sewage. It was large enough, if you wanted to, you could have put a boat out there. I saw people taking baths in, in, in this area of water. One's taking a bath, another is washing their clothes, while another person is getting a pot full of water to go cook it so that they can eat. That's what takes place, and it's all part of the system of religion. No wonder God hates it. Because look what it did to an entire nation. Look what it did. And God is simply saying to us, listen, I want you to worship me and I want you to know my glory. And I want you to know that I have light that I bring into your life, not darkness. And yeah, my heart, I get touched by this. At least one person here tonight is. I get touched by this because I want the glory of God in my life. I want to know him. I want a relationship with him. I want to see his glory. I want to be part of that. And thank God, because of Jesus Christ, we are part of that. We are part of that. Because Jesus is the glory of God. And we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The enemy has blinded people. He has blinded them. The gospel, Paul said, is veiled. Veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. When he said who do not believe, literally in the Greek language, who refuse to believe, who hear and reject, who hear and say, no, I will not accept that. But when you get right with the Lord, God's glory begins to be evident in your life. During this time here, God is moving in a physical and tangible way. The earth shines with his glory. Verse 3, it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Kivar. I fell on my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces towards the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. His response, complete worship. He fell down on his face before God and he saw God's glory entering once again. Now, in verse 6, I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me and he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, nor uh, they nor their kings by the harlotry or with the carcasses of the kings on their high places. When they set their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost, with a wall between them and me, they defiled my holy name by the abominations which they committed. Therefore, I have consumed them in my angry anger. Now let them put their harlotry and the carcasses of their kings far away from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever." God once again says, I will be present with the nation. I will purify my people. You see, a holy God and a holy temple requires a holy people. In the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, Behold, I send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. God is going to come and he's going to purify them. And no longer will they have their abominations. It's interesting in verses 7 and 9, it speaks of the kings. The kings had tombs that were built next to the temple and those dead bodies were defiling the area. So God says this will no longer be the case because he will be present there. They will not be. The decaying bodies will no longer be, and his presence will be with them 
forever. In verse 10, Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities. Let them measure the pattern. And if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangements, its exits and its entrances, its entire design and all its ordinances, all its forms, all its laws. Write it down in their sight so that they may keep its whole design and all its ordinances and perform them. This is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountaintop is most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. I find it interesting. Did you notice with me how he speaks concerning them being ashamed? Verse 11, if they are ashamed of all they have done. In verse 10, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities. There's a certain sense of, of shrinking back. There's a certain sense of saying, I am ashamed of what I've done. The word ashamed there can be translated to blush. That's kind of difficult to see anybody do today, by the way. I, I think that we honestly have a generation that has arisen that don't even know what the word blush means because there's no modesty. There's very little modesty. And, and the sense of that, that there are things that are appropriate and things inappropriate, even, even some believers seem to have a difficulty when it comes to understanding that, that modesty is a, is a precious thing. And even believers sometimes are not ashamed of what they've done. You know, sometimes it's, it's right to feel ashamed. It's right to feel shame for what you've done because that shows that you have a heart and a conscience and, and there's that sense that I feel bad for what I've done. I'm ashamed of how I treated you. I'm ashamed of how I spoke. I'm ashamed of what I did. And, and that's not a bad thing at all. We live in a time today when people don't want to admit to shame or perhaps don't even feel it. We're so busy blaming everybody else for the things that we ourselves do that it's very difficult for me to finally say, you know what, I feel bad about this. But I've discovered that it's not a bad thing to feel shame for the things that you ought to feel shame for. It's not a bad thing at all. Because when you actually have a sense of remorse, when you actually have a sense of feeling, Lord, I am so sorry, or whomever I have hurt you, I'm so sorry, changes actually take place. And so God is saying that there's going to be a time for shame. But at the same time, he says, when they feel that shame, show them the temple and, and give them my word so that they can know that they can have fellowship with me, that this is something that, that actually doesn't keep them from me. It's actually that which I use to draw them to me so that you actually will say, God, I'm so sorry for what I did. There are quite a number of people today I encounter as a minister who, who claim to know Jesus Christ whose lives don't even reflect that they have a clue who he is. They claim that they know him, but there's no evidence that they do. And I'm not talking about me being, you know, a, some kind of guy who's trying to find sin in everybody. God knows that's not the truth. It's just that there, I've had too many conversations over the years with people who have no inclination to, to worship God. They have no inclination to read His Word. They have no desire to fellowship with God's people, none whatsoever. They've never shared about the Lord. They don't talk about God. There's no evidence in them. There's no love in them for God and for people. It's just not there. But when you start talking to them, the first thing they want to do is argue religion. First thing they want to do is tell you, well, I was raised this way. This is my religion, and I'm not stepping away from it. I had a lady call our church many years ago. Her, her child committed their life to Jesus Christ, and the child had been pretty heavy into drugs and, and immorality. But in an invitation here in this church, they had come forward, gave their heart to Christ. And the mother was real upset and called the office and said, I could handle them when they were into drugs and things like that. I can't handle them as a Jesus freak. She preferred her kid to be lost and in bondage to drugs and alcohol and promiscuity than to be a kid whose life was changing. I've seen that many times. I've seen that many times. It's like when the crabs are inside of a bucket and one starts climbing to the top to get out. You know what the other crabs do? They reach up and bring them back down. They don't want them to get away. They don't want them out. They don't want anything climbing over them. And people are like that. And so what I believe very strongly is when God grabs hold of your heart, there's a sense of remorse, there's a sense of sorrow, there's a sense of not so much tearfulness because not everybody cries when they get saved, but there's a sense of brokenness that 
God, you have been merciful to me, and I am so grateful. And uh, Lord, I'm going to live my life for you. And as I look back at what I've done in the past, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's a very true thing in my own life. I can be honest with you when I say that. When I speak about my testimony, when I share my testimony, it brings me to tears every time I do because I remember what I did, and it's been 39 years. And I still know the pain that I caused others, and I still feel bad about it. And there are times that I wake up in the morning, and I have to pray and say, God, please, I'm so sorry. I almost do that kind of thing almost every day where I'll say, Lord, I remember, and it was so many years ago, and I still remember, God, I'm still sorry for what I did. And I don't feel bad about that at all. What it does is it makes me turn to the Lord and say, God, help me never to do that again. And I want to know your presence, and I want to know your word. Well, going on in verses 13 following, I'll just summarize that. I know every one of you read this already, so you're familiar with this. But basically what we have in verses 13 through 17 are simply measurements of the altar of sacrifice. And so that's what you get there. You could read that if you'd like, but that's what you're getting, measurements for the altar. But in verse 18, he said to me, Son of man, thus says the Lord God, these are the ordinances for the altar on the day when it's made for sacrificing burnt offerings on it and for sprinkling blood on it. Now, as I mentioned to you before, the temple, the um, millennial temple will also be referred to as a memorial temple. And it's called the memorial temple because the sacrifices that are offered on that altar are done as a memorial in terms of looking back and knowing what Jesus Christ has done. It's not like there needs to be sacrifices that are being performed as Jesus is ruling and reigning. And the reason there are no sacrifices that need to be made for sin is one, in the book of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 4, it makes it very plain there that the blood of bulls and goats were not capable of, 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 of uh, forgiving sin completely. It was actually in the continual offering, a continual reminder of a need for grace from God. And in chapter 10, verses 10 through 14 of Hebrews, it says, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, died one time for all time. He never needs to be re-sacrificed. And so we, in the New Testament era, look back at the finished work of Christ. Jesus died on the cross for us. And by faith, we have received that offering on our behalf, and that's how we were born again. Now, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices that were being made during Old Testament times was a looking forward to the time when the Messiah would come and take away the sin. And so during this time in the millennial temple, what you have is memorial sacrifices. They're remembering what has taken place. Now the question has to be asked, why do they have these memorial offerings? That's because people need to be evangelized during Jesus' millennial reign. There are people who make it through the tribulation who, who didn't die. So they don't have resurrection bodies. They didn't die. They continue to live. And as they continue to live, they who made it through have been purified, but they're going to have children. And their children are going to need to be brought into faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to need to be evangelized. Isaiah in chapter 65 verse 20 says, No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. The child shall die 100 years old. The sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. There will be death, and it's going to be those who don't have a relationship with God. So there's still a responsibility to, to awaken people to the need to have an allegiance to Jesus, their Messiah. So these sacrifices are going to be those kinds of things that help people to know what Jesus has done on their behalf. And then finally, in verses 19 through 27, which I'm not going to read, he just speaks concerning a summarization of the, of the offerings. Again, the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to Jesus. 
and they're presented as memorial offerings here. God is holy, so the altar must be set apart in such a way as to reveal this to man. Sacrifices of bulls, goats, and rams will be offered, which reveals God being separate and God being holy. And as this is taking place, we'll close with verse 27. I want you to see this. It says, when these days are over, it shall be on the eighth day and thereafter that the priest shall offer your burnt offerings, your peace offerings on the altar, and I will accept you, says the Lord God. These offerings are made in faith. And it's by faith that God accepts you. It was never just the sacrifices. It has always been the faith that motivated the sacrifice, always. It wasn't just that they would bring bulls, goats, and, and all, and, and sacrifice. It was the faith that was behind that. In James chapter 2, verse 23, it says, The Scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God. It was accounted unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. The way that you and I have a relationship with God is through faith in Jesus Christ. I did not get that until I was 20 years old. I honestly did not get that. It was a foreign idea to me. I believed that I could be saved by my good works. And all I had hoped for was two things. One is to live long enough to do more good than evil because I had this belief that God had some scales and he put all my evil works over here and all my good works over here and, and I was hoping that my good works would outweigh my evil ones. And that's the truth. And the second thing I hoped for was to marry a good Catholic girl who would pray my soul out of purgatory. That was pretty much my hope for eternity and I'm not kidding about that. That's the truth. I had hoped to marry a good Catholic girl who would pray my soul out of purgatory. So one, I was hoping to be able to die doing more good than evil, and two, I was hoping to have somebody who could keep me in prayer once I died. I didn't know the finished work of Jesus Christ. I didn't know that I could have a relationship with God through faith in Him. I did not know that. Maybe I just didn't listen closely enough, or maybe it just never was taught to me, but I never knew that. And you can't imagine the surprise when I finally heard the gospel preached clearly and came to that moment of an awareness that I don't have a relationship with God. The only way to have one with God is through Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner. He's not. I need him. God forgive me. God be merciful to me. And that's how I got saved. When I finally heard that God forgives sin. And it isn't all the good things that I can do because there's none good, no, not one. And so everything, even the things that I thought were good, were tainted with self-interest. So I was completely found in sin. And when I finally awakened to that awareness, that's when my life was completely changed. And the motivation for that change was because as a young man, I had a relationship with a young lady and she broke up with me because I was such a jerk and because I really wanted to marry her. I said, there is something wrong with me and that's what drove me to my knees and I finally said, God, change me. And the funny thing about that is this young lady that I so terribly wanted to be with and to marry, I carried a torch for her from the time I was about 19 until I, I, until I was about 24 years old, 25. She was the girl for me. And so one night I was at a friend's house and this girl had told me, you know, I think this guy is really a nice guy. I wish he'd ask me out. And I'm thinking, no, he's not supposed to ask you out. You're supposed to come back to me. I've been waiting for years. And so I was with this guy she had mentioned. He was a friend of mine. And, and he says, you know, this girl is really sweet. I really, I really like her. And I remember looking at him thinking, she's 
she'd go out with you. Now, shall I tell him? And I looked at him and I said, you know, if you asked her out, she'd go out with you. He said, no, nah, she'd never go out with me. I said, believe me, she'd go out with you. I've never forgotten that. And so I didn't pursue it any further. I left it alone, never even really thought much of it because I was still hoping that she'd come back to me. And I was at a Bible study when they announced their engagement and they got married. And I thought, oh my God, do you know my whole life has been ended. This is the girl I know that you had for me. And God said, no, nah, you haven't been to Chino yet. <laughs> You haven't been to Chino yet. And uh, I went, I, I started teaching a Bible study out here in Ontario. And here comes this little girl. Twenty-two years old. She came to Christ in my Bible study. And she needed to be discipled, so I married her. <laughs> she turned 58 years old yesterday. <laughs> Amen. God, God loves you. And God has a wonderful plan for your life. I've learned that. And it's not so much that I accepted him. He accepted me. He accepted me. What a wonder to be accepted by God. Well, what does he say? I will accept you, says the Lord God. It's not that you received him. It's that he received you. It's not that you loved him. He says, no, you love me because I first loved you. And that's how it works in the kingdom of God. And God accepts us on the basis of our receiving his son.